right, my name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Chris Lake. We're at Stoller in Dayton. It's May 31st, 2023. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for asking. Uh, first question to get you started is why wine? I, you know, it's a funny path, really. I think everybody goes through life trying to figure out the thing that makes them most interested and excited about doing something. So I think I was a non-traditional student for a while. You know, I did a couple different colleges until I've kind of settled into a place, a college town in California, where I learned how to brew beer, worked at a brew pub. Well, beer brewing's fun, but you get paid like prep cook's wages, not really a lifestyle I could support. And uh, just north of there, there was a wine region called Paso Robles. And so I got into a winery up there. Kind of liked it. I, I mean, I was attracted to the craft of what you were doing. So there was something about taking raw ingredients, making it something that people would appreciate, taste good. Followed that path down from San Luis Obispo to Santa Barbara. And there I worked at a winery. <clears throat> and surprisingly, there was a woman in the tasting room who thought I was interesting enough to talk to. <laughs> And we eventually got married very quickly, and then from there my path just went on. So I was drawn to this kind of craft of making something that you could offer somebody, and the, the flavors, if they were attractive, if you did your job, they would come back and say, I'd like some more. So let's talk about life before wine a little bit. Tell us about where you were, where you were born and raised, and uh, kind of life before college. So born in Burlingame, California, just south of San Francisco, and then raised in Walnut Creek. So at the time when that town still had walnut trees, and I remember Walnut Festival, but it was suburban, and so it was suburban that was encroaching in farmland in the Bay Area. So I grew up there in a very suburban uh, uh, upbringing. Uh, my father was working as a president of a home building company in Oakland, and you know the anticipation would be I'd finish high school and go off to college. So I did. I did a couple of years at a community college there and then followed that with a trip to San Luis Obispo to try and study industrial technology. You would be a manager on a plant. So interesting for a while, and then it wasn't interesting. <laughs> so did a couple things after that. Um, worked for a landscaping company as kind of a tree surgeon. I'd go climb trees in the morning, cut them down. Um, bartending, restaurant work, and then finally following this path after I found this brewing job and into the wine business. So as you were getting into the interested in wine, tell me about the kind of your initial impressions of wine itself and the people who worked with it. Uh, so it, it came from a bartending job I'd had before. So my exposure to wine was really when I was offering it as a beverage when people were coming into the bar. So it was a full bar, so I did a lot of mixed drinks, but I was fascinated with the people who would like to continue to try the wine. So we would eventually have to try some so that you could recommend it to somebody. Um, and like beer, it has all these different dimensions. Well, lots of beverage alcohol does. But I got fascinated. I just thought, okay, somebody did this. Somebody did something to a plant to make some fruit. And somebody did something to the fruit to make something that tastes good and people like. Mm -hmm. So I kind of followed it a little bit. Didn't know really what I was tasting other than I knew some people like some things. Some people didn't like some things. Um, when I started at wineries, it was really entry-level jobs, so cleaning tanks, washing floors, eventually ended up at a winery in Santa Barbara where um, from my brewing experience and a little bit more of effort to convince the winemaker I knew what I was doing, he'd help me learn a couple more tricks inside the winery, you know, how to rack wine, blend wine, top barrels, lots of things like that. So starting in a winery at the, at the lowest level, obviously, is not the most exciting work. What, what kept you motivated? What kept you excited about being there? Uh, because, you know, you could see a path. You weren't sure, but, you know, people had, you know, positions above you, and there was a possibility you could go on up and do something else with it. You hear about people who are in the wine business for a long time, so it could have been a career path. Mm -hmm. um, sooner or later, you have to make an assessment about what, part of that path you like, whether you want to be in the winery or whether you want to be outside of the winery. So when it was time for me to go do some grape sampling or I was talking to the winemaker and asking him, what is it that makes great wine? Usually the report back was, well, you need really good grapes to make good wine. This is the key ingredient. You can make terrible wine from good grapes, <laughs> but it's very hard to make good wine from bad grapes. So I went up to the vineyard and talked to the vineyard manager and surprisingly the vineyard was more sunny, less wet. <laughs> A little interesting, more seasonal, and I got drawn into what he was doing up there. And 
you know, there, um, I think I was probably 30 at this time in my life. And I came to that realization that I really wanted to sink my teeth into something. But if I stayed in the winery, there was going to be kind of a ceiling I would hit unless I did something more to improve myself to offer more to somebody. So that's when I signed up to go to school in Fresno, California. So signed up to go to plant science at California State University of Fresno. So tell me about that experience coming from, you, you obviously knew, you knew some stuff already, you'd been in the industry a little bit. What was the education like at that point then for you? Well, it was, first I had the challenge of convincing this woman to move from Santa Barbara to Fresno, California. So it's a big dramatic difference in the environment in Santa Barbara to Fresno. But when she said she'd be willing to come along with me, I said, good. So we got married very quickly. <laughs> then in Fresno, uh, was, uh, Fresno State is one of those schools where it's much more um, a practical application of what you learn. So you get the scientific background in all the classwork, but then you're required to do things there. They had a school farm, which is about 120 acres. Mm -hmm. So you had to take a crop project, which was managing, you know, one to five acres of the campus vineyard. You had to go out and operate all the equipment. You had to have a tractor driver's license. Um, I found that to be engaging. And plus, you know, when you're in that kind of program, you find you're with a lot of other non-traditional students. So being 30 in a classroom experience, you might find you're friends with 19-year-olds and you're friends with a 35-year-old who's coming into that program. So I bonded with the people I was working with and shared a common thought that we wanted to do something that was um, going to contribute to the industry. And we felt the industry was growing and there was room for all of us in there. So that felt good. Was there anything surprising or uh, kind of novel about grapevine science, particularly compared to any like other kinds of crops or other kinds of agriculture? No. So, okay, so this is the thing for me. I consider this a weed. It is very, very productive. It travels all around the world. It has a great pedigree, but it's a very durable and very plastic plant. So if I can... Um, knock a little of the shine off of the plant and go down to what are the basic functions? How does this plant work? That's where uh, the education at Fresno State did me good. I could understand root biology. I could understand vascular systems inside the plant. Um, it operates off of a lot of very simple principles. It's a wild plant that was domesticated, usually found around forests. It can grow up through a tree and it doesn't really need to support itself. It latches on with tendrils to get up into the canopy. It'll occupy the entire crown of the tree. It'll essentially kill the tree, so it succeeds. So I found this to be, you know, all powerful in this plant. You just had to learn to harness that stuff, follow the natural tendency of what the plant wants to do, and then maybe you'll be able to get it to produce something that's interesting. So after Fresno State then, or I guess at Fresno State, what were you sort of thinking about as long-term hope or long-term goal? Well, I liked Santa Barbara and Santa Barbara County was beautiful. And since my wife was from there, I thought, oh, well, I'll go to Fresno and then maybe we'll end up back in Santa Barbara. I had worked at a winery and knew some vineyards up there, but it's wildly expensive down there. And as I got into the vineyard business down there, I realized there was some of it that was just a little bit different from what I learned at Fresno, where Fresno would teach you, this is practical farming application. This is how you would grow this vine. Um, while at Fresno, I got on with a research group there. Mm -hmm. So in the Viticulture and Enology Research Center there, I worked under a guy named Keith Striegler, and we worked on raisin and wine grape production up and down the, the Fresno, central San Joaquin Valley, but we'd go over to the coastal district sometime. We'd end over in Santa Barbara. And I just couldn't f see myself fitting into the Santa Barbara winemaking community. It was a little bit more, um, <clears throat> it was very high end and they made some very good wines, but there was a bit of confusion about why you were doing what you're doing. Some of it was, I wanted my wine to have a number that was a better number than my neighbor's wine in the review process. And I thought, I, I'm not really built for that. I'm a little bit more built for taking a vineyard, trying to assess all the environmental conditions there, and then trying to make that plant as productive as possible. So, so after school then, where did you head? So I stayed with that research program after I graduated. 
I stayed on campus as a research technician. The um, man that I was working under, uh, Keith Strigler, ended up taking a job back at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, where he was from, mm -hmm. and called me a little bit later and said, would you mind coming back here? We might get you into a PhD program and then see if you wanted to study on with me and do some work. So Arkansas was a little bit tougher sell for my wife than Fresno. <laughs> You would think, <laughs> but uh, it turns out that we fit fairly well in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And the research program Striegler was doing was tied to his major professor, Justin Morris, and they had a uh, pretty active research in grapevine mechanization. So we looked at lots of aspects of how you would use a machine in a vineyard to accomplish some of the same tasks you do by hand mm -hmm. and uh, fascinated by all that. Plus, I found that the, the program there was really interesting, so moved there with my wife. And by that time, we had had two children, right? No, three. We had three children in Fresno. Then when we got to Fayetteville, we bought a house, worked at the university, had a fourth child. And really, it was a pretty good fit for us. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed being around that academic arena, did extension work with Strigler in Arkansas with the uh, wine industry around there and in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. What was that wine industry like compared to what you'd come from? Well, so he made it a, a very compelling pitch when he was asking me to come back to Fayetteville. He said, uh, you know a little bit about what you're doing there in California, and so you could probably find a job and make a career out of it in California. If you were to come back here to the Mid-South and you were to study how we grow grapes here, he said, you would be challenged by a lot of things. You would be challenged by weather conditions that are highly variable, a lot of insect pests, a lot of uh, diseases, and different kinds of grapes, how they grow them there. He said, if you can accomplish that, if you can successfully learn how to do all that stuff, if you ever want to go back to California or the West Coast, you might have something to offer. So he gave a challenge. and. You know, when you, when you study with somebody for a long enough time, they know you and they know how to set the hook. So it was a great hook, it set well. And I did, I came back there and I found, there's a, a couple of wineries in Arkansas and I eventually ended up leaving the university and going to work for one of them. And they had been around for a long, long time. So I went to work for Weedicker Wine Cellars, which had started in 1880. And so this Swiss German family had been growing grapes and lots of other agricultural crops down there. So the predominant grapes that we worked with in the Midwest are French hybrids. Mm -hmm. okay. So these ones came out of the French experiments to try and save themselves from the devastation of phylloxera. So Chambersin, um, Vignol, Vidal, uh, Munson, uh, it, but there's an interesting avenue that goes across the mid-south, southwest, uh, Arizona, Texas, Arkansas, uh, Virginia, where you can grow vinifera grapes without too much risk. So we grew Chenin Blanc, French Columbard, Cabernet, Merlot, and a few other ones. So I was, at, just as Strigler predicted, a challenge. Lots of diseases, lots of insects. But at Whitaker, I found like that was my first real strong professional opportunity to prove myself as a viticulturist. And how did that work for you? Worked great. It was really, really good. Um, you know, Arkansas is a beautiful, beautiful state. And so they have a lot of different climates down near the River Valley where we were growing grapes. It was a bit warmer and a little bit easier to ripen fruit, but where we lived in Fayetteville, which is about 90 minutes away, it was in the beginning of the Ozarks. Um, really great sense of community, really, really nice town, Fayetteville. And um, would have stayed there if we could. Um, by that time we had adopted one child, so we were now five children in the house and my wife, but I was 90 minutes away from where we were living. So we had a really nice house and a little ranch uh, but I was working in the River Valley, so it, I knew it was going to be a little bit of a struggle to keep that up. And I don't think everybody in my family was ready to move down to where the winery was. <laughs> so we waited to see what next opportunity was, and the next one was a winemaker in Oklahoma 
who knew of the work I was doing at the university and at Whitaker came over and said, would you consider coming to work for me? And at my place, I'd like you to do everything, you know, grow the grapes, make the wine, help me manage the books. And um, I couldn't say no. Yeah. So before we get to Oklahoma, I'm curious, you mentioned obviously the unique challenges in that part of the country for pests and for and diseases and things like that. Did you feel like while you were there, you were making or there was progress being made towards improving the climate or improving the improving the grapes? There was, uh, yes, because I'd gone to a couple of research symposium where we were talking about different cultivars that you would evaluate to be able to work in that climate. The climate is so variable because it's, you know, the it's in Tornado Alley. So one of the big factors for Tornado Alley is cold air, dry air moving off of the Canadian Shield and coming down towards the Gulf and then warm moist air coming up from uh, Gulf of Mexico where they mix, they tend to spin and then it gets exciting. But you can't really control what that season is going to be like. It could be an exceptionally wet season or dry. You have to be fairly nimble about how you're farming to adjust to what the season is going to be. There were uh, kind of novel measures about how you would control some of the insects that were there, but there was so many insects that would eat up a grapevine. I've enjoyed my discussions with Patty um, Skinkus here because Patty did her PhD work in Purdue on Traminette. So we have a lot of interesting topics to cover. I would say back there, the challenge for a grape grower is um, you have to uh, just struggle every season to get the quality needle up to a place where it's acceptable. And then once it's acceptable, if you can take it into wine, you have a very receptive community that loves that kind of wine. Doesn't make it all over the world, but certainly around there. So you work really, really hard and you move the needle, the quality needle up to an acceptable level. Um, it's very hard work, but it's uh, quite enjoyable if you're successful and get it there and you can get something you can offer. I would say here people work as hard or harder trying to get that needle way over to the optimum highest end, right? So you've got a, a level of effort that you're trying to accomplish to get something into a winery that'll make something. Um, you have to adapt to that climate and those kind of grapes, but it, Worked out pretty well. It was a good challenge for me. So then you go to Oklahoma, and as you said, it's kind of a step up in terms of responsibility, in terms of what you're doing. So, but I assume similar challenges from from what weather and past. So tell yeah. us, tell us about that 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 step for you. So it was a great opportunity to kind of look at the whole winery as a whole, and this owner who was interested in trying to see whether he could make a go of transferring it eventually. So he came over with the idea that we would come learn enough about how that business would run, uh, learn where the markets were for the wines that were produced there. And that place was called Stone Bluff Cellars, just south of Tulsa. So we worked really hard, and I think we got to a place where we improved some of the winemaking that we were doing to try and get wines that weren't quite so sweet, uh, but they were still really flavorful and that they would hit the market and be acceptable. Worked in the vineyard to try and, you know, take care of all the challenges that were going, but it was similar to the challenges in Whitaker. So it was just application of pretty good farming practices and we started getting good yield. So things were looking really good. I thought we were in a good place. So when, when, when you were now sort of in charge of the whole process, what were you, did you, did you change your farming practices or your kind of winemaking practices at all to, to fit the environment or were you kind of, were you kind of plugging ahead with what you, how you wanted to do things? I took what I learned at Whitaker and I was trying to apply that a little bit more consistently. So Whitaker was a larger family operation and my role was really limited to what I could do in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Here I really had to husband the grapes along to a point where I could take them into the winery and then I had to really understand the winemaking process to try and get the flavor out of it. Small bottling line. So it took us towards that pathway where we thought we were going to be fairly entrepreneurial. My wife and I had considered we would eventually listen to an offer from the owner and see if we would take it on. Mm -hmm. So I got to learn a little bit about how wine was being marketed in that area. I did enjoy some of the cultivars, but some of the challenges were also significant. So I wondered how we were going to be able to get yield and quality all together on all that. And what was the market like for wine from that area? So if you're in Oklahoma and you produce wine in Oklahoma, you have a great 
hometown market. People love that. Mm -hmm. And the wine was really good. So it was one of the better wineries in Oklahoma. It was just south of Tulsa. But man, you could take it anywhere in Oklahoma. Now you cross the state line and go into Texas and nobody likes Oklahoma wine in Texas. So there's a bit of a, a barrier about where you were gonna get to. But if you could cover a lot of the major metropolitan areas in Oklahoma, you'd do great. So you mentioned you were kind of thinking about that as a potential sort of long-term investment, long-term place to be. So what what happened? What, what caused you to leave? We bought a house. We built, uh, I mean, we bought some property and built a house out there. And we came to that point in that conversation with the owner about what the value of the winery was. We had a perception of what we thought the value of the winery was. He had a different idea about what that idea was. And we thought, okay, well, we'll meet in the middle and find some way to make it but we really couldn't find middle ground. Mm -hmm. Where I was coming from, we didn't have a lot of resources to be able to buy it outright, but we thought we could work our way towards ownership. And that wasn't really what he was looking for. He was looking for direct sales so that he could move on with his life. So at that point, when we kind of came to the decision it wasn't gonna fit, then I had to decide what we were gonna do next because I understood him to be quite true. He was gonna sell it, and I didn't wanna stick around to find out what the new owner would want. From me. Mm -hmm. So I started looking to see what would be the next job. And at that point, what were you, was there a certain place you were looking or a certain role you were looking for? No, what was great since we had moved out of California and we were in Arkansas, we had kind of broke that first barrier of like, you're out of the West Coast, can you really make it and enjoy your life somewhere out of the West Coast? And yes, you can. <laughs> it's not a problem. You know, so there were, we were just looking for opportunities where there was something that we could all enjoy the place we were going to end up landing in and for me that there was a professional opportunity to do something so we just opened up wide to try and see what kind of jobs would be presented what did you find well there were two jobs that were presented so one there was a winery up in canada in the okanagan valley and they flew me out and showed me what they were trying to do that was fascinating the okanagan valley is a great opportunity. It's farther north from here, but they get a lot of extra daylight. They're a little bit farther north in latitude. They have a history of horticulture down these uh, glacial valleys, and the Okanagan is, they have a saying, it's filled with peaches and beaches. And it is in the middle of the summer, so pretty up there. And the winery that was asking for me to come to work uh, presented a great opportunity. You know, they had at least a hundred acres that they were farming there and they wanted another hundred. The wines were great. A winemaker, uh, all the staff were really, really super generous with their time and encouraging. So I looked at that one. And then afterwards I came in and looked at another job that was being offered at a community college in Roseburg. So uh, I went down there, visited with them, met with the president and a couple of the his executives and some of the foundation members, and they expressed an interest. They wanted to do something about teaching people how to grow grapes in Southern Oregon. So I came back to my wife and I said, these are two choices, you know, where do we want to land? And they were both pretty interesting choices. It was a difficult thing to come up with. So with that, with those choices then, what prompted you to go to Roseburg? Um, quality of life. So as much as we loved what we found in the Okanagan, and not surprisingly, the private sector pays a little bit better than a government job, <laughs> the quality of life in Roseburg looked like it was really attractive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we had picked up one other child along the way. So now I have six children in tow <laughs> and my wife. And at a point where we wanted to do something where we would settle into the community, but for me, professionally, I wanted to do something where I could contribute. Uh, I'd been in academics for a long time, and I had known enough about how subject matter could be conveyed to people in a way that hopefully you would gain some understanding after you had had a moment to teach. Mm -hmm. So there was something in it, and I don't mind to talk, so I thought, oh, I can get paid to talk. <laughs> Maybe this is a good thing. <laughs> So we, uh, we evaluated all the choices and thought about whether we wanted to be up in Canada or Southern Oregon, and Southern Oregon won. Mm -hmm. So that's Southern Oregon Wine Institute. It's the Southern Oregon Wine Institute at Umpqua Community College. So tell me about your initial impressions. Uh, so I thought 
part? Well, Oregon has a sterling reputation in the wine business. And so uh, that was a very easy pull. Like, you know that high quality wines were made in Oregon. It struck me that Southern Oregon was a bit under the radar. People didn't really know what was down there. And there was maybe some opportunity for you to kind of dig in. And there was a community support around the college to build this thing up. I was expecting I would go in and start just teaching some viticulture classes. I had some experience with colleagues at Fresno who had gone to Santa Rosa Junior College or some of the other community college, Napa Valley Community College, that teach that subject matter and then people go on to a four-year. So I thought maybe something like that. The, when I ended up there, I found that the administrative folks, president, vice presidents, foundation people were wildly excited about what they wanted to do and very ambitious. So I rethought, what are we doing? I thought, okay, well, if we're going to go and go big and you want to go big, let's see what we can do to really set a, a, a place in Southern Oregon where people could come to from a long way away and they would gain some knowledge and then turn it back into something they could do in their community mm -hmm. and do a little economic development around the community. Mm -hmm. So as you saw the kind of the, like you say, ambitious goals, uh, what did you sort of see as your priorities? What were the first things you had, you yourself had to either do or, or change? Write curricula. <laughs> They had a couple of outlines for classes, but I had to dig in, move in July, write curricula, be ready to teach in September. Um, and then every year or every term, I had to have a new set of curricula because we had a two-year program. So we had to really just hit it pretty hard of putting together uh, coursework to teach. Plus, the idea was that if you're going to teach in Southern Oregon, since it's fairly geographically dispersed, build this into a hybrid instructional model where you would do online lecturing and you would bring students to class at labs on end of the week and weekends. Mm -hmm. So I adjusted a little bit of my thought process about how you would teach somebody if you're gonna be teaching online and doing labs. Mm -hmm. And since there was really no facility on campus, I ended up in the Dean's office with his secretary. And me, I sat in a corner in the back of the office and the Dean and the secretary helped me get along and kind of borrow some classrooms and start moving. So where was at this point, so, so this is right at the beginning of SOWE, right as it's kind of taking, right as it's getting started? Yeah, I was hired as the director. I was the first director there. So they didn't teach any classes before I got there. They had curricula approved that they had, um, they had a committee involved and the curricula had been approved because they had looked at Walla Walla Community College, Napa, Santa Rosa, and they had enough of what they thought that they could do as a teaching component. So handed me a couple of sheets of paper and said, this is what you're gonna teach. And I said, okay, you guys are very ambitious. And there's a little bit of a steep curve here, but uh, you know, at that point, when you're into a project like that, if you've accepted that job, you know that you can get going with it. And as long as there's enough of a people, a team around you, you feel like you've got enough support, you just go. So I had academic support. I had um, director of curricula helping me kind of structure everything. Um, so, I, yeah, I just dug in a lot of antacids. A lot of late nights, got to know the security guards on the campus as I stayed to try and write this stuff together. Um, found people in the community that were winemakers who were also encouraging, had an advisory committee. So the first thing we started with is getting the advisory committee so I could bounce ideas off of them. I remember the, my first day of work, I was out with the vice president of the college, a few of the advisory members and an architect, because the school had been doing something about remodeling um, some of the campus, and this architect was still on retainer. So we ended up at Abacella Winery. Um, I got introduced around. Uh, Pat Spangler, Earl Jones, my vice president, the architect, and uh, we came through the small talk and eventually came to a position of saying, well, Chris, if we're going to teach, we need a building. So what should we put here? So that was a little bit old pressure on the first day. <laughs> so we kind of talked about what do we think a facility would look like on a community college like that. And the discussion revolved around replicating a small scale winery. So I had come from this winery in Oklahoma, relatively small scale, had to do all the aspects of the 
business to finally get bottles out to consumers, I thought if something was like that, that you would just plug a student in in all the different places where you would be doing that same kind of work, that should work fairly well to practically teach somebody what it takes to put together a small winery. So we started with the idea that there would be a building from the get-go, but there was no idea where the money was going to come from or how the whole thing was going to come together, but really, really bold ambition. So like, okay, I'm in with you. I, I, to me, what was exciting was that there are people who had this concept and models from different places, but they wanted to make it happen there, but not all the pieces were in place. You couldn't just take a playbook and said, this is the next step you have to do. You had to participate in the process of growing it and making something happen. And somehow that struck. That was okay with me. I was okay with the antacids and the late nights as long as we could get going and do something interesting. So tell me about the initial, so the initial couple of years. Uh, how, where, did you find a lot of interested students? Did you find uh, facilities you were needed? I mean, how, how did it kind of unroll? So we found students that were coming to us from a long way away. So folks from Grants Pass or Medford, Eugene, one guy from Bend. Uh, the the interaction with the students was interesting because it was online during the week and then we met together for weekends. So the weekends get to be, you know, it felt a little bit like a party. Like you would come for the lab, but then they would all stick around afterwards and they would end up either going to a winery and wine tasting with the uh, owners or they would hang out at a local um, uh, tavern and they would sit and share and bond. So, you know, I got to be around them when they were feeling this, the students, when they were feeling this kind of growing and bonding in position. And then fairly soon after we had laid out the premise that you needed a small teaching winery, then the president and the board of trustees really got into high gear and they started looking for the funding source that was going to start driving this. And luckily they did have really uh, great connections to the community. And then there was one man in the community who ended up being the lead donor in a capital campaign. I was trying to raise enough money to build about a $7 million teaching winery. We engaged uh, Larry Farrar, a winery architect up here, really brilliant. And then a couple of other architectural firms that came together, engineering firms, and we put together this project. And then from those diagrams and scale, went to the community and said, can we use some of your help to get this going? Mm -hmm. This was also 2008, 2009. So we were transitioning out of this economic crisis with the idea that you would be able to take students in and put them into a, a, a growing industry. And there was recovery funding from the federal government that was available. So if you could present something that was a shovel ready project, so you had done the design work, you had basically laid out the premise of what it was gonna be and you had enough matching funding, then the federal government would get involved and they would match up at least 50% of what you were doing. So administratively, with a lead donor of um, Danny Lang, and then going back with Danny to all the other members of the community and said, I gave this much, how much are you good for? We had enough matching funds out of the federal government to actually bring the concept to life, and they started construction in 2010. And how did the, from, from concept to execution, how did the, the finished product turn out? Great. Really, really, I'm quite proud of what was built down there. The fact that you have a state-of-the-art teaching facility and the ability to put students in, to let them come into the winemaking area. And classically, like anybody that starts in the winemaking business, you're going to make mistakes. I remember distinctly blending white wine into red because I didn't know that those two tanks were connected when I was in Santa Barbara. So I knew this was going to happen with a student, but why not do that in an academic institution where you can acknowledge the mistake and say, Look, what did we learn from this? <laughs> Rather than the winemaker at a very expensive winery in Oregon who's probably going to fire you and you're going to learn that, okay, that was a big mistake. I should go do better the next time. So uh, having that component of you know, moderate scale, but commercial scale winemaking, not five gallon carboys and small bottles. I felt like that was a great opportunity. And so um, at the point we got the whole thing up and running, I thought it was going great. And I was very, very proud to be there. 
So take us through kind of the, the time you spent there. Uh, what were sort of the notable, notable accomplishments or achievements in your mind? Uh, so at one point, I think um, getting graduating, the first graduating class that was coming out, finding those students going out and starting some of their own wineries, and then kind of following them now to find out that actually they're still in the industry and they still are doing something that to me uh, felt um, like I had contributed in some way to some of these guys finding their path. Like I, I don't think I was going to stop them if I didn't get involved and I think they were going to go their own way. But you know, that took some time with me and we got to learn where they're at and then f seeing them now as industry members and finding successful careers, th that seems to be very resonant. And then I got into, you know, a larger community of wine educators. So met Al McDonald from Chemeketa. He was one of the first guys like, okay, Al, do you know what you're doing? Cause I'm like struggling. And he says, oh yeah, you know, I was the same for me when I got started at Chemeketa. So I found I was in like-minded uh, company. Um, turns out Jason and I got to meet each other when I got nominated to sit on the board of live. So as Al was trying to move away from his activities in live, he said, bring on this guy from Southern Oregon. Jason Tosh and I got to meet each other there, and then I got to meet other winemakers in this community. I got to be friends with folks from Oregon State and the Extension Service, and I felt like, okay, there's a broader team of people that are really working at ways to try and help and improve the wine industry in Oregon. So that was, those are some of the highlights. I mean, you can build a building, right, and it takes money, but it's only money. And then, you know, as long as you put all that facility together and then you bring people who interact. I've told most of the students, I think there is an academic component of what you should know. There are some things that I think fundamentally that you should understand about how plant works or how fermentation works. But there's another part that I found when I was at Fresno and when I was in Arkansas, that you become colleagues with the people that you're studying with. And you don't know it, you're just friends in school or you're going to have a party with each other. But those relationships persist for a long, long time. And that relationship that you build in that environment and then bridge it out into the industry as you do internships, that becomes glue that holds you together. It's a small industry. So if we learn how to collaborate with each other at school, we can learn how we're going to work together in the industry. And you know? those are the accomplishments I thought I, I got out of the place. So what came next for you after SOE? You know, it was fun being in an academic institution until it wasn't being fun. I can, I can relate to that. It, it did, you know, because you, you sometimes see uh, leadership changes or shift in mission for the academic institution. And um, I ran out of gas. It wasn't the right place for me. So I went to the advisory committee members, told them I was gonna be leaving the college and I wasn't sure what to do next. Um, loved Roseburg, but like, where are we going to go? One of my advisory committee members was Earl Jones. And Earl, uh, he's a re he would tell you he's a recovering academic. He said, come on over and work with me for a little bit. You know, you're going to still try and figure out where your path is. I don't know if Abacella's, and he was running Abacella Winery. Uh, I don't know where you're going to end up for sure, but if you stay with me for a while, we'll have some fun at Abacella. And I said, yes. <laughs> I respected his intellect and the way he ran his vineyard and there were so many different idiosyncrasies about the way Abacella is set up and what grapes are growing and grown there that I dug in and it was a lot of fun. So for about three years I was there with Earl. What was your role? Uh, vineyard manager. Okay. What did you, what were your impressions of the vineyard as you, as you started? First, it was like chaotic. I could not imagine. And you know, he's got a vineyard block he calls chaotic. So the really, they took a huge deep dive into all aspects of what that soil type and environment was there. Then they took different grape cultivars and placed them in different places. He did experiments of vine spacing within a row. So you would walk down a row and the first vines were 12 foot apart. And by the time you get to the far end, they're 12 inches apart. So there was a lot of experiment. There were uh, interns that were always coming in from Europe every summer. So part of the job of the vineyard manager was to get the intern involved in things that were happening in the vineyard, plus to do some of the more uh, scientific things, um, measure photosynthesis, try and figure out uh, um, 
leaves to model conductivity, going out and taking a lot of different measurements and getting those students involved. So it was a connection to students again, but there was also a perception that we were gonna really push as hard as we could into all these cultivars that were growing there, try and find out what their optimum was. Mm -hmm. So enjoyed that. Learned a lot about, you know, other European grapes that I didn't know much about. And it was a great experience. And what came next? Then after that, there was a call from a woman who was one of my students, and I could not believe she was a student. Her name's Melanie Pierce. So Melanie was managing um, Coles Valley Vineyard for the Freeze family. And the Freeze, the original owners of Duck Pond Cellars in Dundee, plus they had Desert Wind up in Washington. Um, great farmers, and they had selected a 300 acre piece of property out in Umqua, which is just west of Sutherland. And they had put in a vineyard there and had been running it for a while. Melanie, I knew her from when she was a student in my class, but she was already a great viticulturist. I did not know why she was in my class, but she had told me originally from New Zealand that she really wanted to learn some aspects, some uh, aspects of the plant, plant physiology. So we bonded, got to, I eventually called her up to be one of my instructors on the winemaking side of it. And at this point, she had then taken on this vineyard management job and called me in 2019 saying that she was going back to New Zealand, would I consider coming over and managing her vineyard, the vineyard that she was working at, uh, Coles Valley Vineyard. And I thought about it and I thought that was a big transition from Abacella, about 76 acres to 300 acres in Coles Valley. But I knew her, I knew her technique for how she managed her vineyard and I knew her staff. So uh, Artemio Zompaxel, who was her lead supervisor, great guy, natural horticulturist. Um, I knew the crew would be good and so I agreed to take on the job. So I gave notice at Abacella and then by December of 2019, I was working at Coles Valley. So you mentioned a big transition, big vineyard. Big so, vineyard. What, so what was that like? Uh, you know, at first I thought, okay, this is gonna be really nuts because 75 acres seemed like a lot to me, but 75 acres was uh, um, a, a lot of dispersed blocks with a lot of different things going on and that you had to manage every one individually. So I'd kind of been trained up in, you know, paying attention to every little thing in every little block. When I came to Coles, it was at 300 acres, only 13 blocks. And each block was about 22 acres. And as long as you had a good crew and you applied uniform techniques to what you were doing in those blocks, the blocks became consistent. So you were managing at larger scale, but a little bit more just fine tuning what was being done in those vineyards. So great source of water, really good climate for ripening fruit. Um, you just had to transition from Tempranillo to Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. But once you got over there, it is still a weed. <laughs> it has a good pedigree. It comes from nice places in the world. Different clones act a little different from one another, but they still all perform just about the same. You have to apply those horticultural techniques. You need enough light and heat, exposure to sun for color, and you can get good fruit. So I enjoyed the transition. Had you worked much with Pinot Noir at that point? A little bit, you know, some at the college, and I had certainly experience from Santa Barbara. So when I was at the Santa Barbara winery, there was a lot of Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, and Santa Barbara. So I recalled those days and that kind of Pinot Noir and tried to apply it to what was going on there. But while I was at the college, of course, you teach this curricula, you have to include Pinot Noir in the curricula. It's important. The textbooks included it, so we're good. <laughs> How does it compare to other things you've been growing? Is, is, there, is there anything different or special about it? It's, uh, it's quite responsive to uh, climate, temperature range. So as you get into temperature ranges where it gets a little warmer, the flavors shift a little bit faster than they do in some other grapes. So some grapes are really durable in their flavor. Cabernet Sauvignon, whether it was grown in Oklahoma, whether it was grown in Northern California, whether it was grown in a lot of other places, it will still keep a very distinctive flavor profile. Pinot Noir, on the other hand, is really highly influenced by where you put it. And so even the Pinot Noir that's coming from parts of Southern Oregon, like Coles Valley, will have a component of flavor that's a little richer 
and maybe not the same nuances that they have up in the northern part of Oregon, but still very attractive and very responsive for people who like to drink it. So I learned that, um, so that's the thing about working with plants. If you get nerdy like I did, that everything has a little bit of a fine tuning thing. And if you, you know, lean into that part of it, you will find this is a never ending story. You are always searching for a little thing you can move one way or another to try and get to that outcome. So I found Pinot Noir to be that kind of plant, a little more responsive. Also found that there was very good Chardonnay that was coming out of that part of Oregon. And I was always hopeful that there would be kind of a, um, a pinnacle of flavor of Chardonnay that's coming out of Oregon. I think Oregon, when it first started, maybe struggled a little bit to find the right kind of Chardonnay or how Chardonnay would be produced in Oregon. But the longer we go down this path, the more likely we're gonna find something that's really, really interesting. So you're, this is just uh, into 2019, you start, you're starting in this new spot. So obviously a lot of changes coming in the next few months after that. Yeah. Uh, tell me about uh, 2020 um, and uh, how, kind of how that impacted your work in your life. Well, so, you know, we've got wildfires, we've got a lot of things that are going on, you know, uh, Coles Valley is big, but it requires uh, mechanical harvesting. And so we had to, I really came on and watched the mechanical harvesting that was going on in the fall of 2019, and then had to adjust for what that looked like, how mechanical harvesting would work for 2020. Um, I kind of dug in with the crew to figure out what was going on. We looked at where the contracts were, where the fruit was being delivered, what the requirements were for that fruit. And as we got to know the people that were receiving that fruit, we got to find out they liked the fruit that was already coming out of the vineyard. So we tried not to mess it up, stay <laughs> fairly close to the target we were already on, um, stick with the crew, um, work on a kind of a thin budget. As I came into 2020, there was a transition in ownership. So it changed from the Freeze family owning this to uh, the Great Oregon Wine Company. And so then I went into understanding what that corporate ownership looked like and how they wanted that fruit and how we were going to deal with the resources we had in the vineyard. What was that process like? It's a little bit like going back into academics. You had meetings and committees and then you had budget reviews and then you had these places where you really kind of hit a wall. There wasn't enough really understanding of what you were trying to do or what resources you needed to get done. So uh, we worked together for a couple of years with the Great Oregon Wine Company and I worked on a really, really restricted budget. So I was trying to figure out exactly how to get the job done with um, uh, minimal resources that we had. Plus we were charged with trying to take about 50 acres of it and run it into organic wine production. So we shifted 50 of the 300 into organic production and took it all the way to certification. So good challenges, um, difficult challenges, a little bit like when I was called to go to Arkansas. You know, you're going into some tough arena Let's see how you do when you have these challenges and limitations to do it. And so I took that on. I thought it was interesting. Hmm. And now you're at Stoller. So how did that happen? So Jason and I knew each other for a while from when we sat as board members on live. And um, so I have six kids. One of my kids was going through this process of writing up her resume and putting it on LinkedIn. She just graduated from U of O. She's a marine biologist. She's saying, I'm just gonna look for jobs. Can I try LinkedIn? And I said, sure, why not? So she put it up on LinkedIn. I went to go look at her bio and I had a message from somebody who was looking for a viticulturist for a large winery in Oregon. I thought, I'll look at the message. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a recruiting firm that was really recruiting for Stoller looking for a vineyard manager. And he said, wait, let me put you in touch with the guy who's actually going to hire you. Jason and I got on the phone, immediately recognized each other, responded. And so this was March or April of 22. And once we started talking, it seemed inevitable that this was going to come together. Because just the proposition that you could come to work for Stoller and Stoller was on this path where they really wanted to grow, it started ringing a lot of bells in my mind. 
Uh, my wife and I had, in the meantime, bought a farm that's down there in Sutherland. So we had this difficult decision about what are we going to do? We've got 100 acres, well, 96 acres just outside of Sutherland with olives and kiwi berry. So we we're trying to figure out how are we going to manage all of that. But the story here is compelling. What Stoller wants to do, uh, Jason's personal interest in having me come to work, um, showing me what the team was. We finally came to some discussion about how long I would stay with. Uh, at that point, the Great Oregon Wine Company had also become a sister company to Atlas Vineyard Management. And I had been transferred from the Oregon Wine Company, the Great Oregon Wine Company, to Atlas. So I worked for about a year with Atlas, managing the same vineyard. Mm -hmm. We had a discussion about how long I would stay with Atlas, and I agreed I would stay through harvest. And then once harvest was done, November, that's when I started up here. So after all that time, you finally made it to the Willamette Valley. I did. Tell me about your initial impressions. Beautiful. I mean, just stunning. And the fact that, you know, there are so many different um, wine companies that are up here in the Willamette Valley and what they're trying to do. Um, uh, so I really like the environment here because we're kind of pushing ourselves to try and make a very premium product. We're, we're willing to step up and say we're on the world stage. You judge us as you would judge any other wine from any other part of the world. And then we're willing to stand on that stage. And I found a lot of consistently good wines around here. My oldest daughter went through uh, the V&E program at OSU and ended up taking a job at Argyle, so she's down the road from me, so I find that to be fun, to be around family. I find that uh, that some of the Oregon wine in the Willamette Valley tends to be kind of pigeonholed a little bit to only producing the highest quality wine, but commensurate with that, it tends to get very high priced. So I know a lot of people that can afford really great high quality wine. I like going to dinner with them, they're fun. <laughs> But I still end up thinking, you know, there's got to be uh, an offering that you can bring to more people. It's a little bit like teaching at the community college scale. There is um, not much requirement for you to enroll in classes at the community college. It's a very open enrollment process and you get a lot of different people coming in there. So I always figured with wine, there should be a lot more advocacy for an easy way for you to get introduced to wine and try different flavors of wine, not the same cheap same flavor that's always on the bottom shelf, to find some kind of flavor profile in this middle level of wine and do something with that so everybody can appreciate that. And um, so I find that this, uh, this is something that Solar's interested in. So as Jason and I started talking, that growth projection where Stoller wants to go includes a wide berth for good quality wine at a reasonable price. So all the fruit I was growing in Coles Valley, working as hard as I could to try and get good quality, still came in at a reasonable price point when I was making a bottle of wine. So to me, that's kind of what I would like to see more of coming out of the Willamette Valley. That approachable kind of wine that, you know, it touches on that high quality that we're known for, but it still delivers at a price that somebody can afford. So I like that challenge. So tell me about, I mean, you've only been here for six months or so, but tell me about sort of the, uh, the role as you understand it and sort of what you've kind of first steps have been since you got here. So vineyard manager is always the person who's responsible for all the crew activities that are gonna go on in the vineyard. So eventually whatever anybody is doing out here, I have to answer for. And I answer directly to Jason, who's the VP. So um, it's a familiar place for me. It's where I've been for quite a bit. What I found is that there was a fairly broad uh, tier of people that are working with me. I have two supervisors, a couple of viticulturists. We have about 20 to 22 tractor drivers. And then beyond that, we have an immense amount of uh, contract labor that comes out to the field. But, you know, it is, it's still basically a plant and we're farming. So all we got to do is just have that conversation. This is how this plant works. In this cooler climate, this is how this plant works in a warmer climate, but they're basic principles of how plants work. And I find that the people that are working with me in the field, they get that. Even if you were never trained with it, if you just look at that plant, you touched it last year, you pruned it, laid it out, and those shoots came up and produced something, you know. You know what a good one looks like, you know what one that's kind of deficient looks like. 
And so we find that uh, the conversation here is uh, more of a group conversation about how are we going to tackle the problems. The challenges we have now is the, the growth challenges, planting new vineyards, getting fines in on time, taking care of the existing vineyards that are just starting to come into production, and the older vineyards that are in renovation phases, you know. But the, the aspect of working with these crews was the same draw that I had when I first came to the uh, Coles Valley Vineyard. It was going from a small-scale producer at Abacella to a larger group that was taking care of 300 acres and still applying that same kind of technique. Mm -hmm. Here we're, you know, so part of the story is, is that after I came on with Stoller, Stoller decided that Coles Valley Vineyard was a nice vineyard, so they went and bought that. So now that's part of the acreage that we farm. So about 450 up here and about 300 down there, and I'm not sure what I got myself into. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I think I'm still compelled by that challenge of really making something good and then you have to have it at scale so that you can produce enough of it so that people can get it. So I'm curious about that, that aspect of, of viticulture at scale like that. So what are the kind of the key components for you in terms of managing that amount of space, that amount of acreage spread out, spread out that geographically? Yeah, Why? right. It, 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 it can be quite challenging. You have to... Um, well, it's always it starts with the site, the location that you've chosen for that vineyard, and what is that uh, comprised of? Do you have wildly changing soil types and different aspects, uh, north-south facing? Um, Abasal had a lot of those, and they focused on minute details there, so you could scale it that way. Most of the sites I see around here that we're working with with Stoller, they have fairly uniform. I mean, there are some changes in soil type from blocks to blocks within vineyard, but it's still, you know, fairly good uniform large farming. So as long as you can then apply a general principle about, okay, this are the these are the techniques we'll use within this farming arena to be able to get the plant to be productive, to produce enough shoots, to understand the right amount of crop to leave on that plant so it'll ripen in that environment and know how much heat you have to ripen that. It, it scales fairly easily, mm -hmm. right? Um, another, another question that kind of arises from that for me is you mentioned kind of vineyard assessment as being a big, big part of what you do. So tell me about, uh, you've gone through your career, you've, 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 you've been introduced to a lot of new vineyards in your career. How do you assess a vineyard? How long does it take? And what is it your, what do you kind of focus on when you're assessing where the vineyard is and what a vineyard might need? Well, lots of times, if you um, pay attention to how that plant is growing in that vineyard, and this is what you do when you're first year managing any kind of agricultural operation, you make a lot of observations and you try and look. So I would spend time at each of the places looking at the conditions of the vines now this year and how they're growing, understanding if we had anything dramatic. Last year there was a big freeze in April, so that would have kind of skewed whatever you were looking at. Things wouldn't look normal, but under normal conditions like we have right now, if you can detect by observation how rapidly all the shoots are presented in that vine, how many shoots actually are popping out, what the length of shoots become, how much leaf area is out there, how much fruit looks like you can ripen on that, um, what are soil conditions, take a shovel out, start digging down, see how much water you can hold in that. Um, we do have varying soil types that we work with here, but you spend a lot of time just observing. How's the plant responding to that environment? And then what would you do next if you wanted to try and encourage that plant to be better or more productive in that environment? Um, and it comes back to, you know, what you're able to see and how that plant is presenting itself in that season. So a lot of the first year really, and this will be my first harvest with Stoller, so a lot of this will be observing the teams and the way that they're actually getting involved in planning for the harvest and then figuring out what components I can add to it. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it's a pretty well-oiled machine here. <laughs> Sometimes I think, mm, well, am I really contributing? Yeah. And then I think, yes, I still got something to give. I still can get in there. And it's a, um, in, in my area, it's a lot of uh, understanding people. So managers, vineyard managers, when we look at vines, we can understand a vine and eventually we can apply the right amount of water, fertilizer, and get it to grow right. It's managing the people that are working in the vineyard, getting them to understand you work together, um, 
getting them to understand this manager supervisor if he tells you to do something and he gives you an instruction on how to do it that's what you must do and then figuring out what they can contribute so somebody in the field can see a plant and say you know this plant's not performing right there's something wrong with this or that if they can bring that back we can actually discuss it and so you start building people's conversational skills among each other then the hierarchy of who's really directing the work and if you spend some time getting to know people, it seems to work okay. So I want to back up for a minute. Uh, for a minute, you mentioned um, when you first came to Oregon, you knew Oregon had a had a pretty strong reputation. Um, Southern Oregon, a little bit kind of, as you felt kind of a little overlooked. So tell me about your kind of initial impressions of the Oregon wine industry in general, um, Southern Oregon specifically, um, and sort of the changes you've seen since you've been a part of the industry. Uh, so Oregon struck me as being comprised of a lot of small wineries and a lot of people who maybe didn't have a lot of farming experience coming into farming grapes to make wine and learning from people in other parts of the world or learning from colleagues in California or Washington about how to do things. So you had a lot of really innovative smaller wineries that were just <laughs> getting themselves in way too deep over their heads and then figuring out how to come out of it and make successful products. And from that, I think you found some very unique wines that are very successful in the marketplace. Um, Southern Oregon comprised of a lot of the same thing. People are in small, but more dispersed areas and different climates, so you can ripen a lot of different grapes. Southern Oregon has a lot of really great opportunities to produce grapes other than Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And I think they've taken some of those to market and made a compelling reason why Oregon's more diverse than what it seems to be as you go to the marketplace. What I've seen change is uh, the Oregon wine industry is maturing and getting larger in scale. And so we see growth in individual wineries starting to get really bigger pieces of market share in the national and international market, and that's led by um, wineries that are pursuing avenues of growth where they can get more people to try their wines. So well, Southern Oregon had a lot of this, come on to Southern Oregon, visit us, taste our wines. And that's a, it's a good call out, it's very hospitable, but not everybody's gonna come to you. So finding a way to take Oregon wines out into that marketplace, that national marketplace, is led by companies that are wanting to scale up and take their wines into a distribution network that's really competitive. And you have to make a compelling story about why your wine would be the one somebody's gonna pick on Wednesday night for pot roast. And that's where the change is coming with Oregon. We're seeing that scale, that consistency is necessary, and a reasonable price point for people that are gonna buy our wines. And so for me, that's what still draws me into it. I think there's a way to take Oregon wines and take them to more places. Well, on that note, what do you see as you look ahead then for the industry? Uh, challenges about um, some consolidation of very large wineries coming together, but um, not to get too anxious about some consolidation. Sometimes as a small wineries, I saw quite a few small wineries in Southern Oregon just really having a difficult time to make it every year, to find the cash flow to keep them going. But they build reputations for themselves. So if the identity of the winery can succeed, even if it's moving into a larger stable, uh, Erath used to call it the string of pearls, and they would have all these different brands under them. That's not bad. You can be you know, still unique within that scenario and moving on. Um, I would encourage people in the Oregon wine industry to continue to be innovative, to take what you know about this environment, maybe put a few different kind of plants in that environment and see if something works. So we do have Tempranillo here on the property. Love to play around with that and see what really cool climate was. Uh, Great Oregon Wine Company had um, some Albarino way out in Sheridan in organic. So, you know, challenges continue to be presented. We're still trying to make a product that people would like. Um, but it's gonna take more capital. And sometimes that capital requires you to link arms with somebody who's got a bigger bank account. <laughs> I'm okay with that. 
and uh, obviously you're just getting started here, but sort of what's next for you? What are you looking ahead to uh, wine-wise, uh, outside of wine? What's on your horizon? So a couple of interesting things. I don't know if you can see it, but just across the highway over there is the Vintages Trailer Park. And my wife and I are continuing to own our property in Southern Oregon. But we bought a trailer, so we're going to move into a trailer park and really get into being in this... Willamette Valley, um, certainly, you know, getting engaged, helping to grow this company, being involved with my daughter down the road. Mm -hmm. And then eventually we still want to keep that property in Southern Oregon, uh, settle in there when we're retired, mm -hmm. have the kids come visit us, pick kiwis and olives. <laughs> <laughs> That's the long-term goal. <laughs> Sounds really nice. It kind of is. It's <laughs> <laughs> work to do here, but it kind of is. There's an end goal in sight. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Well, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have anything we didn't cover today that you'd like to cover? No, that was pretty rich pretty tapestry of stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time, for sharing this beautiful day in the valley with us and yeah. sharing your story with us. And go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.